Hey, welcome on back to Barstool Breakfast. It's just large this time, and I'm having the pleasure to sit down with a guy who's moderately terrifying, but also seems like a nice guy, the world's most dangerous man. I, I would say that uh, when I try to figure out or quantify where people are legends, like no one's ever called me a Wall Street legend. People, I don't know if they refer to Willie as a legend, just because offensive linemen sometimes don't get their due, even with Super Bowl rings. But you can be considered a legend of WWE. You could be considered a legend of the UFC. Probably... You know, because of your Hall of Fame with the UFC is how I'm going to introduce you. UFC legend, world's most dangerous man, Ken Shamak. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So I just to get right into it, I know you've had your fingers in many pots. So you've competed at the professional wrestling circuit. You've competed um, in UFC. And you were one of the guys that made that league, that sport, legitimate. I think you and Gracie were the two guys, and as a result, were the two first members, I think, in the UFC Hall of Fame back in 2003. I think you added legitimacy to that sport. Does Dana White owe you a huge favor? You know how sometimes like the mob guys say, hey, listen, if I ever need <laughs> you, I owe you a favor. Like, does Dana White, is, is he in your back pocket right now for the guy that kind of came in and, and gave legitimacy to this behemoth that we have now? Well, you know, I mean, yeah, I get it, right? Yeah. I mean, you talk about gangsters and owing somebody, I get that. But, you know, really, um, I, nobody owes me anything. I don't owe Dana anything. We went out, we did what we did, and we're rewarded for it by, you know, money and, and fame and, and, and being inducted into the Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. So I think I got what I deserved. I got my just, um, and I'm happy with where I'm at. Um, but uh, at the same time, too, man, it's just awesome to be – that guy, right, that was there in the beginning and then to see where it's at today, it's 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 like standing there watching something uh, like when having a child when it's a baby and it's crawling and it walks, it runs, goes to college and, you know, it starts raising its own family. It's kind of that feeling where it's like just being a proud member of that is just a great feeling. Where is it at today? Like, how do you feel the competitors now or... Like, we've had the opportunity to sit down with a lot of people. We have a lot of UFC guys who kind of come in and out. Some guys are straight fighters. Some guys, like uh, Lionheart, just want to do their, Robbie Lawler, just want to do their talking in the ring, those type guys. Other guys kind of get shticky, like Covington and, and, and those dudes. Where do you see specifically the competitors now? You're a 55-year-old dude? Yes. Yep. And you are a fucking shithouse, right? Like, right now, <laughs> and not, not in the best possible way. You look fucking striated and it's it makes me uncomfortable to be quite honest with you because i'm 47 and i gave up about five years ago you fucking gave up um how do you see the, com the competition in the ufc and then compare it to how it was when you were first coming up and making your bones in the in that league well it, it is it's night and day when you talk about the tournament you're talking about bare knuckle you're talking about you know fighting three four times in one night and then they went to single fights but Still, nonetheless, it was bare knuckle. Mm -hmm. it, was just a, it was a different beast, right? It was just a different way people approached the fight. Um, then they started putting gloves on, and you know, now it became this this big marketing machine where there was money involved, lots of money. Then you know, people became more businessmen. Fighters had to become more understanding of it's a business now. It's not necessarily uh, something you do for fun, even though you still do it, right? It became a business, and uh, and it's the same thing with anything. Football back in the day when they didn't wear helmets or mm -hmm. they wore leather helmets. It was people did it on the weekends. It was fun. They got paid for it. It was it was just fun. And then, of course, you know, the big marketing dollars come in, TV, all that stuff, and Absolutely. now it's a business. And so it's just changed in that fact where it's it's almost like been watered down from that gritty toughness. Um, and I think that's why I, I started this bare knuckle league that I'm Which doing I'm, I'm going to talk about in detail because that's one of the things that fascinates me. Right. But would a guy like you, would a Ken Shamrock, we'll say 25 years ago, because even though it gets a little bit watered down and becomes a business, they're also becoming complete fighters, right. strikers, grapplers, and doing everything. Would a guy who had your skill set at 25 be as successful in the modern-day UFC as you were as he was first coming up? Do you think you'd be tearing through the ranks right now if you were if you were the young man, the young Ken Shamrock, most dangerous man in the world, which I think you still are mm. and stuff, but how do you think you would have done in your prime with these guys now? Well, when I look at that kind of a character, I don't look at whether or not just because they were great back then and they'd be good today. I look at it as a determination, a mindset. Um, you have some guys that, went, that won it back then that just 
we're in the right place at the right time, right? But I believe that anybody, like a Hoist Gracie or myself, mm -hmm. uh, or anybody else at that time that became a champion and was a champion for a while, I mean, I was a champion all over the world, Japan and here, I think it comes down to the determination and the desire to want to be a champion, to want to win. And I think that we had the same tools back then as we did today, if we were going to compare the two, my desires and my determination would be the same. I would just have more tools to do it with. Where'd you get it? Where'd you get the desire from? Who is the, who is the crazy uh, motivated athlete in your family? Well, I didn't. I, I grew up in group homes. I lived on the street. I've actually lived in a car at 10 years old, got stabbed, uh, strong arm robbery, went into a group home, uh, raised in a group home, was adopted by the group home owner. My determination came from a lifestyle of... You either lay down and die or you stand up and fight and literally not just I mean it was literally fight and so I I was one of the guys that said you know what I'm not going to be a victim I'm going to victimize someone